In this episode, we uncover a clue to Jesus' true identity, hidden in the second verse of Mark chapter 1. And it's hidden so well that even the church seems to have forgotten it's there. I am knee-deep into an investigation into who Jesus really is, according to himself and his first followers. So, prepare for battle. At this point in the investigation, I started to get a little bit frustrated. I found something incredible and shocking, but it was so hard to find and it took so much digging that I thought, well, no wonder people are confused about Christianity. Our next item to put on the evidence wall is a quote that Mark used to introduce Jesus. But why? And that's when I found it, sitting right under my nose. Okay, so things started to get weird right away. There was something wrong with a quote. It didn't match the original source. Mark wrote, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Doesn't seem that groundbreaking. Wait a second. Holy rusted metal, Batman! Most Bibles contain a footnote to tell us that Mark was quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But if you go and try to look that verse up, it doesn't match. Mark does eventually go on to quote Isaiah 40, verse 3. But first, in verse 2, he quotes something else. Something nobody seems to have noticed. We actually have two different quotes here, not one. Mark slipped one in under the radar. Didn't think I'd notice, did you, Mark? So the yellow highlight here, that is our verse from Isaiah 40, verse 3. But the green, that is our mystery quote. The mystery quote says something about God sending his messenger. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this chapter of Mark taught on while I was growing up. It's traditionally taught that the messenger being referred to is John the Baptist, but is it really? Something seems fishy about this whole thing. Let's see if any of these study Bibles can tell us what Mark is quoting from. I got out a giant stack of Bibles and started looking through the notes. And some Bibles said that in verse 2, Mark was quoting Malachi 3.1. But I was skeptical because, as it turns out, Malachi 3.1 is just a quote of a book that's even older, Exodus. So I began to suspect that Mark meant to quote that original passage in Exodus. And only a couple Bibles I checked were smart enough to catch that. I don't know why yet. But when I compare the two side by side, I don't know. A few keywords match, but it could easily be coincidence at this point. I was confused. I thought, maybe those study Bibles I looked at that mentioned Exodus were wrong. But then I thought, well, if Mark was going to quote the Old Testament, he wouldn't be quoting from my Bible because it didn't exist yet. Ooh, do we get to time travel? The main Bible Mark would have been reading from was a Greek translation called the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX. So I thought, what happens if I compare Mark 1 verse 2 to Exodus 23 verse 20 in the Septuagint? It looks like we have a match. It turns out the English is the problem. The English translation of Exodus 23 is not very precise. But if you look at the Greek Septuagint and compare that to Mark 1-2, they're pretty much the same. So it looks like Mark really was quoting Exodus 23-20. I felt like I had uncovered something incredible. I mean, this is like the kind of secret message that spies or treasure hunters leave behind for you to find. So my question now is, why is Mark writing like this? Exodus 23 is about an angel who led God's people out of slavery in Egypt and onto some battles where they would reclaim their homeland. Only, it's not just any old angel. There was one angel in the Old Testament period called the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. 
The angel was believed to be God himself. Not many people know this is there, but in the Old Testament period, the Jews believed that God would sometimes take the form of a man, a filtered form, because the belief was that no one can see God and live. So if he appeared in a filtered form, people could speak with him face to face and basically they wouldn't die. So let me get this straight. Mark was trying to link an angel who was God himself in the form of a man to Jesus. I don't know why I'd never heard any of this before. I mean, there are 20, 25 passages about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. According to scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, Jews were comfortable with the belief that God would sometimes take on a second form, at least early in their history. There were two God or Yahweh figures who were one and the same. It was still considered monotheism. It turns out this is part of an old ancient belief called the two powers in heaven. The Jews eventually declared it a heresy after Jesus' death in the second century. I bet you can figure out why. It's because Jesus' followers connected God's second form with Jesus. So in Exodus, God appeared as a man. And then Mark quotes Exodus to say that God is again appearing as a man, but this time as Jesus. So this is like one of those math equations. Wish I'd paid attention in math class. Transitive property of equality. A equals B, and if B equals C, then A equals C. So the angel equals God, and the angel equals Jesus. So God equals Jesus. Jesus equals God. That's a pretty wild claim. Why don't we see if any other New Testament authors made the same claim? Maybe somebody else associated Jesus with this angel. And then we can confirm this theory. Oh, you're not going to believe this. It wasn't that long ago when I found this person. I just remember being stunned. Like, why didn't I see this before? Jesus is going to come right out and say it. Jesus led the Exodus. The angel that led the people out of Egypt, he is saying, was Jesus himself. Thanks, Jude. Now I know I'm not crazy. Hmm. The obvious question is, why didn't Mark just come right out and say Jesus is the angel of the Lord? Good question. That does leave some lingering doubt. Okay, I found a possible explanation from a scholar named Tim Mackey. He's really thorough, by the way. So he says that Mark didn't want people to get confused and think that Jesus was merely an angel. So he downplayed that whole angel thing. You know, this actually makes a lot of sense because Mark's primary audience was not Jewish and they would have no background knowledge on this whole angel of the Lord thing. So they'd probably just get confused if he said Jesus is the angel. So by dropping that verse here as a clue though, anyone who was Jewish would find this nugget and immediately understand what the whole book's about. He's trying to say that Jesus is God himself, while everyone else would read right over it like it wasn't even there. Mark's a genius. If he were alive, he could totally take over Facebook. Truth be told, some Bible translators were not comfortable with what Jude said about Jesus leading the Exodus. So some removed Jesus' name and they replaced it with the word Lord. But it's still really there in the context. It's just less noticeable. All you have to do is back up one verse and see how Jude defined Lord. He said in the previous verse, the only Lord is Jesus. Well, I lost about two months of my life reading about all of that. But I think I know what Mark is trying to say now. He's hinting the idea that Jesus is God appearing as a man again. Just like in the Old Testament, but this time he was actually born as a man. So I think we can finally file this under. Mark is trying to depict Jesus as divine by quoting Exodus 23, 20. It's time to put this on the wall. Ah, almost
forgot about the magic yarn. That was a lot of work. We haven't even gotten to this verse yet. I feel bad for people who are just trying to figure out, is Jesus God? Who is Jesus? Because it really wasn't very easy to connect some of these dots. It took hours. <laughs> Should it really take that long to figure out basic Christianity? I feel like I have to think on the level of a scholar. But then I thought, we are so far removed from the way ancient people thought and wrote that yeah, for us, the text is just complicated. I think we should celebrate by eating an entire tub of ice cream. Nom nom nom. But I don't have any ice cream. Up next in our investigation of Mark 1 verse 3. So it looks like when Mark used this Isaiah quote that we were originally going to investigate, he left out a few words. So what's up with that? This looks important. Hey, if you enjoyed this investigation, hit subscribe and turn on notifications because we're going to look at every major point in the book of Mark where Jesus is depicted as God and see what's there. So if you have any questions, put those in the comments too. Maybe I can answer them, look into them, or maybe they'll show up in one of these episodes, which would be really cool. So thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.